to minister to you tonight. Hallelujah, Father, you're worthy, you're holy, you're mighty. Hallelujah, 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 Father, we give you praise, we give you glory and honor. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, glory to your name, God. Glory to your name. You do miracles. 
even though, you know, it's just hard to, it's kind of cluttery, but I'm telling you, in the next few days and in the next few months, direction will come, clarity will come, come and you will fulfill all that God has ordained you to do. And I thank you, Father, for this mighty young man. I thank you that he knows you and he knows your voice voice of a stranger who will never follow. And I ask you to protect him, watch over him, and I protect what he has to do for you. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the fire of God on his life. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Books. One I wrote it's called No Longer Shackled. Um, Pastor Ed will verify it's a good book, all right? And uh, it's No Longer Shackled. Now, you don't need a paper, uh, brown paper bag to buy that book. A lot of people, because it says how to be free of sin's control, doesn't mean that you're walking in sin if you buy that book. And uh, But I will tell you this, the testimonies that I have, um, I've helped a number of people get off of drugs, get off of alcohol um, all over the world. I have one young man in Chile. His mom was in part of our uh, Bible school that we have down there. And her son was backslidden, um, just really messed up. And uh, he wanted to come home. And she said, you can only come back to my house if we'll do a study out of this book. And you have to promise me that you'll do a study out of this book. Well, that young man just graduated from our Bible school. He just uh, got married. And his whole life is turned around because of the, not because of the book, because of the word that's in that book. And so, but you say, well, that's not me. But uh, how many of you have ever walked in the flesh? Then you need that book. And so then the second book is a, is a prequel. Y'all know what a prequel is? It's like um, it's like Star Wars 3, 4, and 5. Then you go back and watch Star, 4, Star Wars 1, 2, and 3. Or something like that. I don't know how they did it. Anyway, so it's called No Longer Condemned. Um, that book came out of an answer. Um, I was asking the Lord. A lot of ministers were asking me about uh, the grace message. And about how people were, um, you know, in some ways kind of, uh, we believe, I mean, I'm sorry, grateful for grace. I'm grateful for the grace of God. But some people, every doctrine, the devil tries to make a wind out of, and it tries to mess people up. Well, people were asking me about it, and uh, I was talking to the Lord. I was driving up from Huntsville. I was preaching in Effingham, Illinois, and I was all in the car all by myself. And so for about a few hours there, the Lord and I talked about it. And while I was driving, and poof, out came this book. And it's called No Longer Condemned. And um, uh, I had already done a series on it, but I preached kind of the message. And uh, 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 people said, that sounds like a book, and the Lord already dealt with me. So this book is a little bit, the second book is a little easier to read. And, um, but it's real uh, um, encouraging. And if you know anyone who's backslidden, if you uh, have ever been condemned, or you just want to have a message so that you can help somebody who's condemned. Um, it comes right out of the word, out of Romans chapter number 8, and it will bless you. Now, because we're pastors and we don't make up a whole lot of CDs, we have some in our bookstore. Um, but everything's free now. I blame Brother Keith more. Um, everything's free now. And uh, so uh, you can go on our, uh, we have a, an app. Y'all have an iPhone? We have an app. And it's uh, Cornerstone Word of Life Church. You search that. Um, I send out uh, Monday through Friday a thing called Daily Bread. Um, we go over a scripture a week, and we meditate on it. And there's five short teaching lessons uh, where I break the scripture down into five bite-sized morsels daily bread. And Jesus said, you're not live by bread alone. We're, but, the, you know, man's bread, but we need his bread. And so he is the bread of life. And so we do that. And then um, there, uh, my uh, media guy put a list of, um, of some of my recent um, uh, messages out there. Like this one I did um, recently. I love the title of it. Um, it's called, If I Were the Devil. If I Were the Devil. Um, and so the Lord, it's taking the, um, some things that we taught a different way, but looking at it from... If I were the devil, this is what I'd do to you. 
And so I go through a lot of the stuff that the enemy is doing to people. That The Bible says don't be ignorant of the devil's devices. It surprises me today how many believers are still ignorant of the devil's devices. And so it's to, um, you know, not to be offensive, it's to ignorant proof the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to say I'm not ignorant. It's not good to be ignorant, is it? And so that's what, that's what we do. And there's a lot of those things out there. Amen. Well, I'm not going to take any further time. Um, my wife's going to come and minister the word. And uh, I believe you're going to receive everything that God has for you tonight. Amen. 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 Well, glory to God. Amen. I love hungry people. Amen. You're here on a Friday night. I know you're hungry. Amen. Saturday. Oh, my goodness. That's even more. That's even more so because we were here last night, too, weren't we? All right, before we approach the word, let's pray. Father, uh, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you for this vibrant body of believers. I thank you, Lord, for the plans that you have for them. Father, I thank you that even in the days just before us, uh, doors are opening unto this body of believers. Do I saw it last night in the spirit. A door, a particular door is opening to this body of believers. And so we say door open in Jesus' name. Opportunities, uh -huh. opportunities, new uh, places in Jesus' name. Uh, in new places in the spirit, new opportunities, new connections that will open doors to people groups that are ordained to be part of this body. And I thank you for it, Father. Father, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, we bless this church. We bless these pastors. We bless these people who have gathered together right here in the heart of Illinois. Father, I thank you for the plans you have for this body. Plans to bless to prosper and we thank you for it now tonight father i ask you to think through my mind to speak through my lips father you know what all is on my heart and i ask you to help me get out what you would have this people here tonight father i thank you that it'll be just enough it won't be too much but father i thank you that exactly what needs to be said will be said exactly what needs to be done will be done and it will all be to the glory of your son. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen, amen. I'm just so excited to be here. I was telling Pastor Mark this afternoon, there's so much running around in my heart. We could make this a 10-part series tonight. <laughs> we, again, you don't have anywhere to be till 10.30 in the morning, right? No, I'm just teasing. I'm, I'm only half teasing. Um, I believe we're going to get done exactly what God wants us to get done tonight. And so I want to take just a moment. We're going to jump off of, well, before I even do that, I want to honor your pastors. I love me some Trent and Rhonda. <laughs> Pastor Trent and Pastor Rhonda. I'll tell you, I didn't grow up with them like Mark did. I don't have, you know, uh, decades and decades of history with them. But I do remember the first time I met them in Paris, Illinois. Uh, I told my husband later, there's just something on them. There's something about them. And you are honored to have them as your pastors. You really are. I, I, I tell you, people who are hungry for God, people who are not content but are always striving for the greater uh, plan of God, you're honored to have them. They're equipping you with tools you need to live your very best life. That is an exciting thing to me. Because although, listen, you'll get used to me, okay? It took my church people a while. I'm kind of like black coffee. I'm an acquired taste, okay? Uh, for the end of the night, you're going to get used to me, okay? I, I, I'm blonde, and I'm a little bit here, there, and everywhere, but it's all good, okay? But but you have fantabulous pastors, and I mean that sincerely. P pastors who are going after the plan of God, not content to stop along the way. They want everything God has. They're equipping you with the word, equipping you with the spirit of God. You know what that makes you? That makes you extraordinary. Amen. You're ordinary people with the extra of God on you. Amen. Listen, in this last day, 
He wants to bring out of the treasure that's being put into you every Sunday and every Wednesday to answer the cry of a lost and dying world. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, our nation's in trouble. There is a whole bunch of stuff going on that needs God's hand right smack in the middle of it. If ever there was a time when we need demonstrations of the glory and the power of God, if ever there was a time when the world needs what the church has, it's now. And listen, don't let their hard-heartedness fool you. It's not going to take a lot to turn this ship. People are hungry. They're just not content anymore with religion. They're not content anymore with status quo. If there's no life in it, if there's no reality in it, they don't want it. And you know what? Neither do I. But you got it. Right here. It's him. And if you're born again, he lives in you. He lives in you. Pastor Mark last night was talking about praying out the plan of God for your life, praying out things in your life. And he said it's no longer just a convenience. It's no longer just an add-on. It's a necessity in this day and age. Why? Because the dark is getting darker, but the light is getting brighter. I tell you, the world needs what you have on the inside of you. You need to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, always sensitive to, to that unction of the Holy Ghost, to minister to somebody, to say something, to touch somebody, to bless somebody. If you're paying attention, you'll get those unctions because he never intended for us to live like mere men down here. Listen, he doesn't want you to be weird. You know, if, if you're going to be weird, don't tell them you go to church here, okay? <laughs> he wants you to be supernatural. Yeah, come on. Just natural with his super on your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're ministering to somebody in the grocery store, how many of you know you don't need to jump up and do the funky chicken and, uh, you know, talk in tongues and... Uh, how many of you know you can deliver the word of the Lord without ever saying, thus saith the Lord? You can be supernatural, but you've got a supernatural God living on the inside of you who wants that. He wants you to let him out. Some of you held him in there so long, it might have been 1976 last time he saw daylight. I trust not in this church. But I'm telling you, he's got things for you to do in this day and age. There's a world that needs what you have on the inside of you. There's a generation of young people that's crying out for reality, that's crying out for relationship. Oh my goodness, this is not even my message yet. Lord help me. Well, they need what you have. How do you know? How do you get the right place at the right time? By doing what Pastor Mark was talking about last night. Praying stuff out. Submitting your way unto the Lord. Obeying when he speaks. That's one thing I wanted to... Oh, goodness. Let's go ahead. Okay. Let's go back here to my message. Let me find it. Let's go to Romans 8 and 14. And before we go there, let's go to John 16, 13. This is where Pastor Mark left off last night. John 16, 13. It says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Pastor Mark was saying last night, we don't always have to be playing defense with the devil. What he does catches us off guard. No, when we pray things out by the Holy Ghost, he'll show us things that are coming. Not only just attacks on the enemy, but good things for your life. 
I'll tell you, uh, the other scripture I want to look at real fast is uh, Romans 8, 14. Romans 8, 14. I'm sorry, I'm so hyper tonight. I'll settle down here in a minute. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How many of you are, have the Spirit of God on the inside of you? Well, he's not just to be in there doing nothing. We're supposed to be led by the unction of the Holy One. Amen. That means every day, as you're sensitive, Father, is there anything you need me to do today? What can I do for you today, sir? If there's anybody you need to touch, you just unctionize me, sir, and I'll purpose to listen. I tell you, that's how you go from divine appointment to divine appointment. We had a lady in our church, just a, a, a regular old church person. And she, she pulled me aside one Sunday and she said, uh, Pastor Rhonda, I want to tell you what happened to me a while back. And I said, okay. She said, I was going to Walmart. How many of you know God can move in Walmart? Yeah. She said, I was going to Walmart. And she said, I kept having this unction or this, uh, I don't know, just kept coming up in my heart to put a beach towel in my, in my vehicle. And she said, I thought, why would I put a beach towel in my vehicle to go to Walmart? <laughs> so she said, I started not to do it, but she said, every time I go to leave, it was there. Put a beach towel in your vehicle. So she thought a minute, she said, you know, what, what harm would it do for me to put a beach towel in my vehicle? So she put a beach towel in her vehicle, and she drove to Walmart and pulled into a parking space. And she noticed a few spaces down, a lady was working on her car. She had the hood up, and, uh, and, and you know, I don't know a whole lot about cars, um, but she was pouring gas in the carburetor, trying to get it to do something, maybe the out of gas. I don't know anything about anything. Just, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm, I drive it till it stops, and then I call work. Um, <laughs> but she, she was, whatever she was doing was wrong, because all of a sudden it blew back up on her, and caught her on fire. And now this woman is dancing around, slapping herself on fire. Our church members, a couple uh, parking spaces down, freaked out. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, the beach towel. She grabbed the beach towel, was able to smother out the flames and save that woman's life because she had an auction out of the ordinary. How many of you know that's the kind of things we, that we ought to have happen? In the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing to be a blessing to humanity. Right. Amen. I know in my own uh, in my own house one day I was sitting on my back um, deck and we had a tree cutter. One of our trees had died, and so he was cutting out this giant tree in the backyard. And so uh, you know our associate pastor was recovering from a surgery, and I had taken her into my home to take care of her. And so. We, we both went outside together and sat on the deck and watched the dude fell this giant tree in our yard. It was a giant tree. I mean, like, shook the house, boom, you know, and it felt it was very cool. But anyway, uh, he got the tree down, and all of a sudden, he comes kind of stumbling towards us, and he's yelling, my heart, my heart. And I said, uh, you know, I, I'll get, I'll, what can I do? Let me get you an aspirin. Let me call 911. But before I do, I slap my hand on his head. I didn't even ask. I slapped my hand on his head and I said, in the name of Jesus, you be well. I command this to stop. And then I ran for my phone. I ran for the aspirin. And when I got back out, he's just looking at me wide-eyed. He said, you're not going to believe this. He said, well, maybe you will. But he said, when you put your hand on my head, I felt something come into me. And all my pain stopped. Glory to God. Well, Pastor Ronda, that's because you're called to the ministry. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. The very same God that healed that man. Now the inside of me lives on the inside of you. He's just waiting. He's just waiting for you to let him out. He's just waiting for you to listen for the unction that will change people's lives. Oh, my goodness. I don't have time for all this. There's so much I want to say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Don't stand there, say it. Okay. <laughs> In uh, 2017-ish, February, 
My 35-year-old nephew was riding a hoverboard and was run over by a giant truck and was disastrously injured. Uh, I mean, I found out later his thigh bone was shoved clear up into his body cavity. I I mean, he was was hurt bad. And so they get into the hospital and, and for whatever reason, which I still don't understand, they didn't realize he was currently bleeding internally. And so when they went in to fix his leg, his hip was shattered. And when they, they took him to surgery a couple days after the accident, when they opened him up, he coded uh, because he'd been bleeding out on the inside and now all that blood was literally you know, leaving his body and he died. He died on the operating table. So they uh, got paddles, you know, and they, they shocked him and shocked him and worked on him and got him, uh, his heart started again and they sewed him up real quick and got him to ICU and, and they called my sister and how many of you know my sister, well, you don't know, but my sister don't believe like I believe. <laughs> she believes all this faith stuff is too much. You know, God can heal if he wants to heal, but he might heal, he doesn't have to heal. Sometimes he will, sometimes he won't. You just never know what God's gonna do. Well, in my estimation, that's a little bit insulting to God. If somebody said to me, you know, that Rhonda, you never know what she's going to do. If she's going to ever keep her word or, I'm, anyway, I won't, I won't go too far. Uh, but anyway, so she doesn't believe like I do. But how many of you know desperation does funny things to people? So she called me when she got in trouble. And she said, help me. He's my only son. And he died, and they told me he's not going to live. And she said, he's coding again. Help me. So the one thing I knew to do was go to my bedroom. I'm, I'm, I'm several states away. You understand, I'm thousands and thousands of miles from where they are. And uh, I went to my bedroom, and I just began to make his case before God. I said, Father, he is a young man with three small children. And with three children, I said, this can't be your will for his life to end at this point. And I said, Father, he's not been doing everything just right. He's not been living right. But I am saying, uh, I'm asking you to intervene. And what kept rising up in my heart is, I will not let him go. I will not let him go. And so I just began to say that. And I began to yell at. By the time I was done, I was in my bedroom all alone, thousands of miles away, yelling. I will not let him go. I will not let him go. Listen, I'm on an adventure with God learning my authority. I have figured out we got way more authority than we (coughs) ever dreamed we did. So I'm yelling in my bedroom thousands of miles away from where he is. And so I didn't know what else to do. So I picked up my phone. And that's all I texted to my sister. I will not let him go. She texted me a little while later and she said, Rhonda, when your text came in, I had the pen in my hand to sign a do not resuscitate. If he had gone one more time and he did, they were going to let him go. I was going to let him die. But she said, I had the pen in my hand to sign it and your text jolted me back to reality. And, And I didn't sign it. And she said, but he's in a terrible state. And I said, girl, I'm on it as best I know how to do from here. I'm on it. You know, and so I just was believing God with her. And I mean, he was months in the hospital. He had strokes. He had heart attacks. He had a trach. He couldn't breathe on his own. I mean, he was just a mess for for months and months and months. And when they got the trach out, he said to his mom, he said, mom, you saved my life. And she said, what do you mean, son? He said, mom, I was out of my body and I was on my way to heaven. And she said, he said, I heard you yelling. He said, mom, I heard you yelling. I will not let him go. She said, son, that wasn't me. How is your Aunt Rhonda in another state? But he heard me. He heard me. 
Sometimes we make declarations of faith and we wonder, is it going above the ceiling? Uh, and in that moment, if you'd have asked me in my bedroom, I felt nothing. I knew that I didn't know that anything was happening. I didn't know that God was enabling or doing supernatural things. I was just doing what I knew to do. But he heard me. And he quoted me word for word what I said. And he said those words brought him back to the earth. I tell you, just a few months ago, I got to go see him. I cried, we cried, we hugged, we, oh, it was so wonderful. He drove himself to the restaurant where we ate. He walked in of his own accord. He still got some things. He still needs yet another surgery. Uh, but I'm telling you, it's a miracle of God. He's here. But my point is this. That just happened to be an instance where God pulled back the curtain and let me see what was going on. What is my point to you? Your faith works. Amen. Your declarations of faith do more than you could ever imagine. Listen, when I was in my bedroom all alone, crying out of my heart to God, heaven heard me. My voice was reverberating in the heavens, bringing to pass that which I was saying. Amen. Well, good for you, Pastor Rhonda. If that's all you're getting out of this, you're missing the point entirely. When you express your faith and make a declaration of faith, heaven hears you. Hell hears you. It reverberates through the heavenlies and far more is accomplished than you would ever imagine. Your words are powerful. Fighting for people. Believing for people. Your declarations of faith are doing far more than you would ever imagine. Don't you ever be discouraged. I was thousands of miles away. I saw nothing. If that did anything in that moment, I didn't know it. But God. But God. But God. Glory to God. So listen, there are things, short-term assignments God gives you. You can pray out little things to do every day. Take a beach towel. Say this when you pray. All those are those little daily unctions that we get from the Spirit of God that we ought to be living by. But sometimes he'll also give you a dream. How many of you has God ever given you a dream for your life? Something he's promised you that you've not yet seen come to pass. Listen, I want to encourage you today. Don't you dare let go of those dreams. Don't you let go of your dreams. God will bring them to pass at last if you don't let go. But how many of you know you can miss the supernatural by looking for the spectacular? When I was in my bedroom yelling, I, how many of you know I didn't see a thing? I didn't know anything. What happened was supernatural. But it wasn't necessarily spectacular in that moment. You know, sometimes we think if we don't feel goosebumps or, you know, shiver down your spine, then God's not doing nothing. But how many of you know that's just not true? You can live a supernatural, natural life. Joseph had a dream from God. He had a dream that he would be a ruler someday and that his brothers would bow down to him. Mistakenly for him, he shared that dream with his brothers who were already jealous of him because his father loved him so much. You know, most of you know the story, but I'll try to make it brief. Um, his brothers were so angry at his dream that they decided to kill him. And one brother was able, literally to kill him, but one brother was able to dissuade them and they threw him in a pit while they were trying to figure out what to do with him. And one brother said, we can't, we can't kill him, let's sell him into slavery. Oh, like that's so much better, right? So, so uh, a caravan was passing by that was headed to Egypt and 
that they sold him as a slave, and then they took his special coat his dad had given him, and they put uh, animal blood on him, and they took it back and told his dad, he's dead. An animal must have gotten in. This is all that's left. And uh, they sold him into slavery. Um, well, how many of you know, it, it looked like, that didn't look like rulership. Do you understand what I'm saying? It didn't look like the plan of God was coming to pass at all. In fact, it looked like the exact opposite. <coughs> so he gets there, you know, and, and uh, he worked in the house of a guy named Potiphar. And the Bible says everything prospered under his hand. And Potiphar made him second in control of his house and entrusted everything to him because everything prospered in his hand. Well, how many of you know being second in charge as a slave is better than being the lowest slave, I guess? Or, you know, so he was second in charge as a slave. And, um, you know, Potiphar's wife, she, she kind of took a liking to him. And she's thinking, you know, I'm going I'm to give me some of that. <laughs> um, that's, that's a nice looking man. And, you know, I, I don't look for that verbiage in there because it ain't in there. That's right. <laughs> she, uh, she. <coughs> I started saying she got the hot swarm. That's not in there either. Uh, but, uh, you know, she, she, uh, she liked him. And so she was trying to entice him to, to do things with her he ought not be doing. You understand? Uh, and so it's a G-rated version for a Saturday night. Um, and uh, so he refused because he said, you know, I'm not going to stab my master who trusts me in the back like that. You know, he trusts me with everything. He trusts me with you, and I'm not going to compromise. And so he refused to, to, uh, to do what she wanted done. And so as he was leaving, she grabbed a hold of his coat, and he just left it in her hand so he could run away because uh, he was determined he wasn't going to sin, but she had his coat then. And when Potiphar, the boss, came home, she said, look, your slave tried to lay with me, tried to rape me, and I still have this jacket here. This is proof. You all know all this. Most of you know, but I, I had somebody in my church say, don't assume you all know the stories. So I'm not going to go. I don't want to assume you all know. So... Uh, he, he ended up in prison for, for nothing. I mean, we know we're going from bad to worse. It's bad enough to be a slave. Now he's in prison, right? But, but the favor of God was on him. He worked his way up to second in command of the prison, which I don't even know what that means. Maybe he got a blanket. Nobody else did. Or maybe if there was one bean in the soup, he got the bean. I don't know what, you know, uh, what the benefits of second in command were. But he was second in command of the prison, but he's still in prison. And two of the king's servants got thrown in there with him, and, and they both had dreams, and they, he, they wanted someone to interpret the dream, and Joseph said, I can do it. So he told them, one of you is going to be executed, one of you is going to be restored to the king, and when you're restored, don't forget me. It happened exactly the way he said, but the guy forgot it. The guy got restored, went back to serve the king, or the pharaoh, and forgot all about it. Right? So how many of you know Joseph had an opportunity to be bitter? He had an opportunity to be discouraged. God promised him in this dream that he was going to be a ruler, that he was going to be great. And now he's the lowest of the low and sinking lower every day. But when the Pharaoh had a dream that he needed interpreted, then I think it was the cupbearer. He remembered Joseph. And, and he said, you know, I know somebody who can do your dream, who can uh, reveal your dream and, and tell you what it means. So he, they called Joseph up out of the prison. Long story short, he told him the dream, and he told him what it meant. Uh, I mean, it's one thing just to tell him what it meant, but he told him the dream first. How I many of you know you can't fake that? God gave him the dream, and then he told him what it meant, all right? And, and, and uh, so anyway, he got second command in Egypt, and, and then there was a famine in all the other land. He, he started setting things in order the way God had told him to do so that <coughs> Egypt would have grain and, and be okay when the famine came. Because the famine was coming, that was the point of the dream. And his family, though, came from another land to buy grain. And they all bowed down before him. They didn't recognize him, didn't know who he was. But God had sent him ahead to save his family. But it happened just the way he saw in his heart. They ultimately did bow down to him. Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> and so the dream came true. I said all that to say this. Let's go to Psalms 105. Verse 16, I'm going to read from the King James. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land, and he break the whole staff of bread. And he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. 
he was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Whoa. Let's think about that a minute. The Bible says that word that God gave to Joseph, until it came to pass, that word tried him. He wasn't trying God to see if God could bring it to pass. The word that God spoke tried him. Tested his character. Tested his determination. <clears throat> Tested his faith. Would he hang on? Would he believe? When it looked like it was all going backwards. When it looked like none of it was ever going to come to pass. When things got worse instead of better. When he went lower instead of higher. That word, every step of the way, every day that word tested him. Tested his faith. Tested his determination. I won't ask you how many of you have ever had God tell you something and all of a sudden it went the other way. Or it didn't end up looking like anything like God had said. Listen, that plan and the things that Joseph went through, where it was full of hardships and full of, 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 of ugliness and, and pain and things he never anticipated, experiences he could never have imagined, they were all there on the way to the fulfilling of his dream. And the whole way, those things were testing him. Seeing if he was ready for his destiny. Seeing if he could hang in there when, when everything around him looked like it was anything but what God said. You know, years and, and years ago, 25 years ago now, God put a dream in my husband's heart to start a church in Madison, Alabama. And in his heart, he saw thousands of people there. And he, it was so such a supernatural call of God. He called him down there to, to Alabama from Illinois. He thought, surely there will be hundreds of people here. My very first service. So they prepared for 100 people. I mean, they expected, they believed their guts out. And one lady and two kids showed up, and they never came back. Second service, it was him and the man who came to help him start the church. His wife and their two-year-old child. Nobody showed up from Alabama. They got up. They said, Pastor Mark said, what are you doing? They said, well, we might as well work on the church. Nobody's here. He said, this is a church, and I'm preaching to you. Sit down. Sit <laughs> He went a couple weeks, several weeks, with just the four of them. He, the man who came to help him, his wife, and their two-year-old. How many of you know, during that time, it was testing him. Does he have longevity? Is he going to stick it out when things get tough? Does he have the faith to hang in there when it looked like, how I many people were staying away by the thousands? <laughs> Sometimes he looks at him and he's like, where were you? Because we have, we have a, a, a good sized church now. And he looks at them and he goes, where were you 25 years ago? But it's all good. They all came in time. But how many of you know that sometimes there's just no way around that testing time? There just isn't. We had to grow up. It took us 10 years to break 100. There's a lot of opportunity in there to be discouraged. A lot of opportunity to give up. But God. But God. Now we're a multicultural, multinational church set in the middle of Alabama, which in itself is a sign and a wonder and a miracle. Amen. Not just African American and white, we got all nations represented. I love it. We have seven, last time I counted, we had 17 nations represented, first generation immigrants, people who were born somewhere else, 
who came here. We have a whole Chinese contingent. We have a whole we have people from Samoa, from the islands of the sea, from, from Nigeria, from Africa, all over everywhere. I get up on Sunday morning and look, how do we look like heaven? I love it. God did bring his word to pass, but listen to me. It wasn't as fast as we wanted it. It wasn't the way we thought it was going to go. But every one of those Sundays when we stood up to preach anyway, every, every time we were faithful and held to the plan and believed our guts out, God was taking us one step closer to that dream coming true. Amen. That, that word to us, that word that God dropped in his heart, tested us. Until it was time. I'm everywhere in the whole world, but it's okay. Psalms 105, 19 in the NLT, the New Living Translation says, Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Listen, when things aren't going the way you thought they would, when the work is too hard and the plan takes twists and turns you did not anticipate, the plan is trying you. Are you going to stick with it? Are you going to be faithful? Are you going to believe what God said, even when year after year it looks like anything but? If you do that, the day will come when the word of God will be fulfilled. It might not come the way you thought. It might not come when you thought. But what is it that God has promised you? If you don't let go of it, he will bring it to pass. At last, he will. Amen. But from the time that he drops it in your heart until the time that you go, it's here. What you do in the middle there is everything. A whole lot of people give up in the middle there. Some of them even get angry and bitter at God, <coughs> thinking he promised me this thing. He told me this was going to happen, and it was going to be this way. But it's not that way. It's not anything like that. Listen to me. If it's not anything like that, it just means it's not done yet. He's not finished working. God builds for a lifetime. Some things are not done overnight. He has to position people. He's got to get you ready. He's got to work things out of you and work things into you so that when you get there, you're ready. Joseph passed the test. And we had every opportunity to be bitter and angry, full of hurt and disappointment, even at God. You told me this, and, and, and it's because of your dream that I'm here in this prison. Why did you even give me that dream? How many of you know that would have been easy for him to do? I'll try to tell you another story, but I got hurt. One of the greatest books I read in my whole adult life that meant the most to me is called One, I should remember, One Witness by Aggie Hurst. She, um, her family in 1918 uh, was in Sweden, and her parents got a call. They felt like God spoke to them to go to Africa. And God told them they were going to be part of bringing Africa to Christ. They were going to have a significant part in bringing Africa to Christ. So they were very young. They had a two-year-old son. They were in their early 20s. They, they got on a ship back in those days. There was no commercial aircraft going internationally. So they got on a ship, went to Africa. They, they took their machetes, and they beat their way through the jungle. They got to the furthest, most mission station, and they said they didn't stop there. They said, no, our, our call is beyond. And so they, they went beyond the, the mission station that went out there on their own with another, uh, another young couple. And, and everywhere they went, they got rejected. I mean, they got ran out of the villages. Nobody would listen to them. 
they, they, you know, they were struggling. It was hard. It, it was hot. And, and they were sick. And they didn't have adequate food. And, and they, so they were hacking their way through the jungles. You understand, this is hard. This is a hard deal. And so finally, they got to, to this one last village. And, and the, the elder, uh, the chief, he rejected them. Said they couldn't uh, share their message there. And he forbid any of his people to have anything to do with them. But by then, they had malaria. They were too sick to go on. And so they, they built them a little mud hut off outside of the village, a little way away from the village. And, and that's where they lived while they tried to regain their health and tried to recover their health. But the only thing the village chief would do is allow one little boy to come and trade with them for things. Um, and so they uh, interacted with this young man. He was under 10. Uh, he, they reacted... Uh, uh, they interacted with this little boy and, and would trade things with him. And, uh, you know, finally the wife one day, she said, you know what? I came to Africa to win Africans, and this little boy is an African. So she made up her mind, I'm going to win this little boy to Christ. Amen. So she began loving on him. She began talking to him. She began uh, building a relationship with him. And finally, one day they knelt together in the mud. And she led this little boy to Christ. I don't know how old he was, six, seven, eight years old. Um, then she got pregnant. Now, they're already sick, you understand. Well, well, after she, uh, her, she was able to get through the pregnancy, uh, she was able to go through the stress of giving birth, but shortly thereafter, she died. Now, about this point in the book, I'm going to throw the book out. All right? It's so dark, and I was so depressed. I was like, good Lord, I don't know how anybody can make anything come out of this story. But the minute she died, her husband lost it. It's a true story. It's absolutely it. The gospel, true story. Her husband lost it. He got so angry at God. You said you were going to give us part of Africa. You said that if we would come, we would be instrumental in winning Africa for you. He said, it's been nothing but struggle and heartache and, and, and sorrow. And now you've taken my wife. How many of you know God didn't take his wife? Amen. But he didn't know any different. He didn't know what you know. Aren't you glad for good pastors? Yep. Who equip you with the truth. Amen. So you know who it is that steals, kills, and destroys. <laughs> but he didn't know that. So he got so mad at God. He just lost his mind. So he grabbed up the baby and he grabbed up his son and started hacking his way back through the jungle. And by the time they got back to the mission station, the baby was near death because it hadn't been nursed properly and hadn't been taken care of properly. And he, did, he said, I don't care. I'm going home. Uh, I've lost it all. My, my wife is dead. I've lost everything. You know, it's nothing for nothing. We've not been able to do anything. Our life didn't make any difference at all. He was so angry at God. And, and the missionaries that they knew there, they said, please, leave the baby with us or she's going to die. Please. So he left the baby with them. And then they were going to come back to Sweden and, and, and bring him the baby uh, in a few years. When they, you know, when they could, when the baby was stronger, they were going to leave themselves and bring the baby back to him in Sweden. Well, in the meantime, so he hacks his way, gets on a ship, goes back to Sweden, becomes a raging alcoholic. True story. Hated God bitter, 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 bitter. Just didn't serve God, you know, uh, for, for decades, wouldn't serve God, hated God, hated everything about it. God took his wife from him. God took everything for him, and it was all for nothing. And in the meantime, the people he left the baby with, now it's a true story, uh, some, some local people uh, that they had tried to minister to poisoned them and killed them. So now, oh, I know, it's a terrible story so far. And trust me, hang on, hang on, everybody, pass your seatbelts. Wait, wait till you hear, wait till you hear the end of the story. This is a true story. It's a true story. So uh, now, nobody knows exactly who the baby belongs to. They know the names, they know the country, but in the pre-internet days, pre-transatlantic flight days, they, it might as well have been no information. You understand? So nobody knew who the baby belonged to. So some American missionary said, we'll, we'll take her and we'll raise her as our own because the people that he left them with died. Uh, and so they, they took her and they took her as their own and they brought her back to the United States. And uh, she, she grew up here. She, uh, her parents pastored after that. They never went back to Africa. Uh, and while uh, they were pastoring, she grew up. She met a pastor, married a pastor, entered the ministry. Uh, and, and so they were pastoring here in the United States. She and her husband now, she's all grown. 
And uh, one day in her mailbox was a, a magazine from Sweden in, in a language she didn't speak. She has no idea how it got in her mailbox to this day. Uh, and so, but it was in there. And so she was flipping through it, trying to figure out how, what it was because she didn't speak the language or how it got in her mailbox. She saw a picture of a cross with her mom's name on it. So she took it to the uh, university and found somebody who spoke, I don't know what language it is. Swiss? Swiss. 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 Is it Swiss? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> Swiss. <laughs> it was Swiss, I know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sweden? Swedish. Swedish. Okay, he says the Swedish, you can look it up later. <laughs> Google it. I don't know what language. Anyway, so she took it. This is, this is a true story, I promise you. I'm telling you the truth. She took it to uh, somebody who speaks Swedish, um, and she said, you know, it's my mom's name. What is this? Listen to me. It was a story about a little boy who had knelt in the jungle with this woman whose grave this was. And he went on to serve God. He led his entire village to Christ. At that point, he had led 600 other Africans to Christ. Oh my goodness. She was flipped out. She, so she, she was so happy to, you know, to know a little bit of the story and uh, and uh, but but she didn't know even uh, really how to get a hold of a man who wrote the article. So they were in the assemblies of God, and um, they went to a ministers' conference. And, but it was an international thing where all these ministers were coming from all the nations. And um, this is really funny. I love this part. But uh, they were at the night meeting, and all these uh, ministers from the nations were getting up and sharing what God had been doing in their nations. And they got bored. <laughs> the, the, anyway, I thought that was funny. I'm the only one. The pastor and his wife, they got bored and they went home, but they were supposed to meet their friends for dinner later, so they came back right at the end of the meeting and acted like they never left. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> We've never done that. <laughs> I also have to clarify, just for the record. Um, okay, so <laughs> as they're coming back in, there's a man up speaking from Africa. And it, and it caught her attention. All of a sudden, he's telling the story of her family. How the woman had knelt with him in the mud and led him to Christ. And how he then went on and he built a school in his village and as part of their curriculum he taught Christ. And, and because of that he ended up being able to get their entire village born again. Listen to me. And not only that, now he had gone on to be head of the assemblies of God in that nation. He had won hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. She went up to him afterwards and she said, I, I think that's my mom. And he said, are you that baby? And she said, I, I think I am. And they hugged and they rejoiced together. And he said, I know. I'll, let me take you to your mom's grave. I mean, so they, they were able to take a trip to Africa, and she got to see her mom's grave and where they lived. And her mom was widely regarded as the mother of this move of God wow. in that nation. Wow. Now listen, so, some people are saying, see, it takes a quarter week to fall into the ground and die before it brings forth much fruit. That is not the part. That is not what I'm telling. Hang on. Hang on. So through all that, she, as time went on and technology got better and things got better, her family paid, or uh, her church uh, paid for her and her husband to go to Sweden and find her family. And so she was able to, through, through the article, through the man, she was able to figure out what region they were from. She, she ultimately found her dad. Now listen, he had gone on to have other kids, but he was a raging alcoholic. He was, a, I mean, still full of hate and bitterness. And when she came, they told her, whatever you do, don't you mention his name. If you do, I don't know how he's going to react. He's going to go crazy. Because we're not allowed to say anything about God at the expense of him just losing it, right? So she goes in there and, and she said, Dad, it's me. He's 
until his, you know, he, he was very ill now. Alcohol has destroyed his body. And her name, her birth name was like Ainia or something. And she said, it's me, it's, it's Ainia. And he rolled over and he looked at her and he said, you know, is it really you? She said, it is. He said, I never meant to give you away. That they were supposed to bring you to me. And she said, it's okay, Dad. God protected me. God took care of me. And he lost it. He started screaming and cursing and throwing things. And he said, you're not to speak that name here. He took everything from me. I gave him everything. I struggled and I tried to do his will. And nothing came of it. And then he took everything from me. She said, Dad. And he said, for what? For nothing. Nothing was accomplished. Nothing was achieved by in the giving of our lives. She said, Dad, it's not so. It's not so. Let me tell you what happened after you left. That little boy that mama knelt with in the mud has gone on to win his whole village, became a great soul winner. Papa, he's now the head of the Assemblies of God in that entire nation, having won hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. It was worth it. Your sacrifice was not in vain. God took your obedience and made something of it. Listen to me. She was able, with that, to lead him back to the Lord. True story. Days before he died. Listen, that man was faithful for maybe two years. And unfaithful for the next 50. But he had fruit that remained. He had fruit that remained. But listen to me. The thing I want to get to you is this. I believe the plan of God was for them to be the mother and the father of that move of God in that nation. But he gave up. He got bitter. When it didn't look like it was going the way he thought, he gave up. And he got angry at God. Instead of saying, Father, this looks anything but like what you said. Father, my precious wife died there. But I'm going to stay. And I'm going to do what you said. Because I believe your word is true. In spite of what I see. He didn't know about faith. He didn't have good pastors that taught them the truth like you know. He didn't know he could access healing. She didn't know they could access healing. But you got to respect their willingness to go, though they didn't know what you know. Aren't you glad to have the word that yeah. equips you where you can access healing? Where you can stand in faith when adversity comes. They didn't know what you know. I believe with all my heart, had he been faithful, he would have been the father of that move. That was the plan of God. But because he got discouraged when the way got hard and he gave up on the dream, he wasted 50 years and forfeited his position. His name is not even a footnote in the nation's Christian history. His wife's name is there. But his is not. Not to mention the fact that I'm sure when he got to heaven, she kicked his butt all over heaven. <laughs> I gave my life. I died there and you quit. I'm sure, I'm sure she kicked his butt all over heaven. But it was one of the greatest stories I ever read of the lengths God goes to to work his plan. And to redeem the life of somebody who once served him. Incredible. 50 years in the making. God, God spared her. Had she gone with him, she might have been abused. Uh, she would have been raised as, as the daughter of an alcoholic. Do you understand what I'm saying? God knows what she would have gone through. I don't even know what happened to the little son they had. I, I don't know what happened to him. But God spared her alive like Joseph. So that she could come back and win him to Christ before he died. My point is this. 
Even when I can't see it, he's working. Amen. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. Because he never stops. Never stops working. He never stops. He never stops working. Listen, his word to you will come to pass at last. If you don't give up on it. If you don't stop. If you don't quit. I don't care if it's been a year or two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. You hang in there and you keep believing God and you keep being faithful. And that word that God spoke to you will come to pass at last. I've heard two amazing stories in the last uh, a couple months about you know, wayward children who've been off doing their own thing. And after 20, 30 years, God is bringing them home. God has arranged circumstance after circumstance, put people in their life to bring them to pass long after it would have been so easy for the parents to give up. What is it that God's spoken to you? What dream has he put in your heart? Has he promised you that, that you would be wealthy so that you could bless ministries? Has he promised you that your children would serve him? Has, what has he promised you? Don't you ever give up. Don't you ever give up. And from the time that you said amen after he dropped that dream in you to the time that you go, oh, there it is. It's that middle time. But that word is testing you. Listen, I can say for us, we had an awful lot of growing up to do when it comes to our church. God gave us a few people. There ain't that many we can hurt. <laughs> to begin with. As we grew up, no, but we not hurt really. We worked really hard to love everybody, take care of everybody. But you can understand what I'm saying. Maybe you don't. Um, <laughs> but we had to grow up. We had to learn how to do things better. You know, one time we were in, in uh, on vacation and we were crying to the Lord, you know. You know, we're doing everything we know to do, Lord, we're not growing. It's so much bigger in our hearts than what we're seeing. We don't know what else to do. What else can we do? We're doing what we know to do. He said, I'm not going to kill you. I said, excuse me? He said, you're doing everything in, in your power that you can do. If I give you any more people, it's going to kill you. We were working 120 hours a week doing everything because nobody could do it as good as we. Right? <laughs> people tell us their problems, we carry it around and walk the floor at night. They dumped it and felt better. It took me a long time to figure that out. <laughs> they went to the movies with their friend while I'm facing the floor crying. <laughs> we had to learn to delegate. We had to learn we're not the Savior. We can't carry people. We can't carry their problems. We have to trust other people that God brings along inside us to carry and shoulder some of the load with us. Trust that the Holy Ghost in them is going to be okay and help them, help us. There's things we had to learn before that dream could come to pass. God fully intends to bring your dreams to pass. Don't you give up on it. Don't you give up. The years test you. The circumstances test you. The word that God spoke tests you. Between that period from when it's deposited to when it comes to pass. So that you're ready when it gets here. So that you can walk it out. And be what God intended you to be. Listen. I believe with all my heart that that woman's death was not necessary in Africa. She didn't know about healing. She didn't know about faith. She didn't know what you know. She was out there trying to serve God with her limited knowledge. And the devil was able to get a fast one in and take her life. But because she was faithful to the end, she's the mother of that movement. And her husband forfeited his position. Listen, be like Joseph. Doesn't matter what's thrown at you. Doesn't matter how long it takes. God didn't speak something to you that won't come to pass. Listen, I have served him 
for 50, I'm embarrassed to tell you, 54-ish years now. I received Christ when I was a little bitty girl. And listen, he has never lied to me. I can tell you, in those 50-some years of walking with him, he has never lied to me. It may not always come to pass the way I thought it was going to come to pass. It might not always come to pass as fast as I thought it was going to come to pass. It might not come to pass, uh, you know, uh, when I wanted it to come to pass. But his word always comes to pass. Just the way he said. Just the way he said. Just don't give up on it. Don't give up on it. What has he spoken to you? What has he spoken to you? Don't give up on the dream. Don't let the devil steal that from you. God intends to bring it to pass. Just keep believing. Even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. Because he never stops. He never stops working. During that time, from the amen to the, oh, here it is. What does God want from you? He wants constancy. I had to look that word up. Constancy. Constancy is the quality of staying the same. It's a lack of change. The quality of being loyal to a person or belief. Steadfastness of mind under duress, stress, and pressure. Fortitude. Listen. Uh, I'll finish. Fidelity. Loyalty. It's a state of being constant or unchanging. What is that? You hang in there. You hang in there. Now listen. Some of you got to face reality. The devil's not just going to let your kids go because God said. He's going to try to talk you out of it. He's going to kind of try to cause you to be discouraged and give up and quit praying. Why? Because he doesn't want your dream to come to pass. So he's going to try to outweigh you. See if he can discourage you. See if he can cause you to look at circumstances around you that will cause you to give up on your dream. But if you hang in there, you need to be like that bulldog. I hear tell, and I don't know if it's true, I think it is, that a bulldog will lock its jaw when it grabs a hold of something. I had a friend who had a bulldog, and he said, when my dog grabbed a hold of one end of that bone, I could pick up the bone and the dog by the other end. Shake him around. That dog's not letting go because he has his jaw locked on that bone. Listen, lock your jaw. Lock your jaw. I don't care what it looks like. I'm not quitting. I don't care what the devil does. I don't care what kind of mess my kids get into. I don't care what it looks like. They will serve God. They will fulfill the plan of God. They will. I'm not giving up. I Now listen, it's a lot easier for me to say than it is to stand year after year after year. But if you don't give up, it will come to pass at last. It will. You will have everything God said you would have. Don't you let him take stuff from you. I am so sick of that devil. Lord, help me. I can't stand him. And you know what? It works out because he can't stand me either. <laughs> the devil will try to talk you out of it. He's going to try to outweigh you. He's going to try to discourage you. But if you hang on, God will. Father, uh, Father, you are not a man that you should lie. Have you not said it and will you not do it? Father, we choose this night to believe that which you've spoken to our hearts. 
Father, even if the way was hard and even if things didn't look like what we thought they'd look like, even if things didn't go the way we expected, we didn't anticipate all the twists and the turns and the hardships along the road. But Father, our eyes are on you. Our trust is in you. And Father, this night, anything that we've let go of, I ask you to remind us. Father, we'll pick it back up tonight because we are determined. We will not do without what God said. We will not do without what God said. Ah, uh, it shall. It shall. destinies and will be a blessing to humanity and father everywhere we go on any given day there are people that you'd like us to touch people you'd like us to love back to you help us father to be sensitive to those little unctions to bless somebody, to love on somebody, to pray for somebody, to encourage somebody. Father, I thank you for the supernatural lives you ordained for every person in this room. Father, it doesn't have to be spectacular, but being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, to make a difference in somebody's life is supernatural. And I thank you, Father, for making our lives significant for you. I thank you, Father, for this church. I thank you for the impact that the Word of God has here in Champaign, Illinois. And I add my faith that the word of God has free course. The word of God has free course into this area, into this community, Father. I thank you that it will go forth unhindered in Jesus' name. We drive back every demonic force in hell that's arrayed itself to stop the plan of God. And we say you will not be able to stop what God has ordained. Move. Move in Jesus' name. Be gone. Be gone in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you that every dream that you've ever downloaded into the heart of Pastor Trent and Rhonda, I thank you, Father, that it comes to pass. Oh, ho, oh, in its fullness, Father, in its fullness, we set ourselves in agreement tonight, Father, everything. Everything that you downloaded into the man, everything that you downloaded into the woman of God, it shall come to pass. We contend for it, Father. We fight for it, Father. We'll not settle for less. We'll not be content to be kept out. But it shall come to pass. Uh -huh. I thank you, Lord, for arming this people with the knowledge of your spirit and how to work with you. I thank you, Holy One, that you reside on the inside of them, constantly giving them an unction, constantly giving them direction, what to do, where to be, how to do it. And I thank you that as they listen to that, Father, oh, that the church is increased on every side. More importantly, the kingdom of God and the earth is increased on every side. Hell 
is plundered and heaven is populated. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit. We trust you, Holy One, to auctionize us where we need to be, what we need to be doing. We purpose to obey. We purpose to obey. Thank you for your precious word that goes forth in this church. That church, that word that gives us the sword of the spirit that is effectual in its work, cutting, cutting asunder the chains of darkness, cutting through, ha, 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 all the deception of the enemy, cutting through, Father, all that would keep us down, keep us back from the full plan of God. You've armed us with your sword. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So grateful, Father, to be in a church that teaches faith, that teaches us how to stand, that teaches us how to be victorious every time the devil raises his ugly head. Father, I thank you. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, for this group of victorious, world-changing people, with the word of God on their tongue, with the unction of the Holy One on the inside, Father. Ha, ha, ha. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. So be it. Ha, ha. So be it that an army is raised here in Champaign. Ha, an army is raised an army that do know their God and will do exploits. They do know their God and they will do exploits, not just through the pastors, but through the members, through the people, through the congregation, because they too now know their God. Ah, so be it. So be it. So be it forever changed by the word of the power of God. And I thank you for those new doors that's now open in this place. Those new doors, Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all just stand up for just a second. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Father, we magnify you. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. He's so good. So good. Hallelujah. Well, we haven't talked a whole lot, and so you haven't told me much, but um, this is what I sense, and then I thought maybe we'd do some of this tomorrow, but... Um, uh, the Lord is using you, you know, uh, and sometimes in your mind we think, you know, so quickly you've elevated us to a place where it's always feel ready and prepared, but then when it comes to the local church, you almost feel like some ways you kind of got out ahead of where you are at the local church, and sometimes you feel inadequate, but this is what I sense, you're building a team of leaders around you, and even as you were going, uh, you had someone or something that seemed like it was going to help, and yet it didn't work out. And the Lord is, has really just put it on my heart to tell you that, that even it seems to me within this year and then going to the next year, uh, it'll look altogether different right around you. Not that anyone else, no one's leaving, but there's a gathering around you. There's a gathering around you to lift you up, to elevate you to a place where you can do everything that's in your heart. And what I saw last night about that meat fork, I see it again tonight. You reaching into this community, into this region, into the 22 and under. Such a strong reach out into, into young adults. The youth will begin to explode in this place. And the children will grow up and do mighty things for God. And such, such, such leadership, but with your hand on it, with your DNA. If you could do it yourself, they'll do it this way. They'll do it because you're anointed, you're graced, and you're pulling people around you. And then into this city, 
and the city's round about. Such a respect is going to come for you. Not because you already had the Lord just tell me. They, uh, so many people, when they have an anointing or grace in life, they get like the big head and they hear am I, but you've never thought that. You so respect other churches, not just within our group, but other ministers. You so respect admire them and lift them up and because of that because you've humbled yourself I'm telling you that God is going to use you in a mighty way and not just as a pastor but you're already a minister to ministers but and that's within our group but it's going to go citywide they're going to respect you and they're going to honor you because you've humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God. Because you've proven you can come under so that you can go over. You've proved it year after year after year. When others told you to leave his side, you stayed until God released you to go. And because you've done that, the Lord has tested you. The Lord has tried you. And he has found you worthy to be exalted. And I'm telling you, there's an anointing coming on your life. And already they do flow. But the gifts of the Spirit are going to begin to move through you in such a perfect and no great way. In Jesus' name. Tongues, interpretation. Tongues, interpretation. Tongues, interpretation. Tongues, interpretation. It goes back and forth, 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 back and forth. It's going to be amazing. Oh, my goodness. The, the secrets of men's hearts being revealed, helping many healings, anointings, graces, and demonstrations, and, and not only on them, but on this body. And it will not just be in this room, and this room will not be able to contain what is going to go on, and it will go out from this place through you. You'll be anointed to do it. And you believe, God, that there's a team coming around them, that there's already a great group of people around, the great church. I sense it. I don't know anybody. Haven't even met everybody yet. But I'm telling you, I know by the Spirit of God, great things are about to happen because we're going to you're holding fast to your dream. 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 Anyone? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord. Father, we magnify Him. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I got one more thing, and then we're going to let you go tonight. This came up with my heart. Well, I'm going to tell Mary now. I want to finish. What I sensed was even people that have those kind of things um, that God's going to use you to set those kind of set people free that I can almost see I don't know what, it's almost like you could in the near future <laughs> almost have a wall of devices that people have been free from hallelujah I believe God's going to use you that way that's why it's singing in my heart so I want to finish that up hallelujah listen to me this is what came up in my heart Time does not heal any wounds. Time has never healed anyone. Not physically, not emotionally. There's somebody in this room, you've held on to something for so long. Somebody shattered your dreams. Somebody hurt you. And you do your best. Oh, if I can tell you something, my, my wife is the queen of the love walk. She teaches in our church. Um, and she has such great, great revelation. And it kind of goes to that. And so I don't know why he's telling me to tell you, but come on, you got to let it go. Somebody needs to let it go. Time, you know, people have told you, just you know, give it a little more time. Time won't heal it. That's the stupidest saying ever. Time has never healed anyone. Time won't heal you. Many times, time will make it worse. You just fester and get worse. And let me tell you something else. God has never disappointed you. I don't have time, but I'm telling you, God has never disappointed you. You might think he did, but you don't know everything. But God is not the author of disappointment. You better settle that. 
The devil's the one who steals, kills, and destroys. And you may not understand everything that's going on in your life, but you have to wake up tomorrow and trust God. And I'm just going to tell you one more time. Time is not going to heal your wound. You're going to have to make a choice and a decision to, to forgive somebody, to let it go. Why would you let anyone or anything that, that disappointed you or failed you, why would it let why would you let it go on one more day, keeping you out of the plan and the perfect will of God? Trust God. Believe God. Yeah, but it hurts. What? It's just like healing. You just keep confessing the word, believe. The Lord, He's the restorer of the broken heart. And I don't know if it's what exactly it is because the Lord's not telling me everything. He just said for me to tell someone, time is not going to heal that one. If it can, it doesn't know how. Jesus is the healer. He's the physical healer, and he's the vendor of a broken heart. And you've got to make up your mind that you're not going to let anyone, anyone, keep you in that place. Listen, God, I've been pastor for 25 years, been in ministry 30 years, 56 some odd years old. I've been hurt. You've been hurt. But you can't draw back from a hurt and get all protected and let nobody in. You've got something to do for God. Forgive somebody. Let the disappointment go. Believe God. And it's all going to be all right. Forgiveness is a choice. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. In other words, the last thing you could feel like doing is forgiving. Because you're upset. Rightly so. But listen, the moment you allow anger, bitterness, and hatred in your heart. Now you're the one in sin. Don't give anybody that much power to come between you and God. Don't give anybody that much power to hurt your relationship with your father. You choose to forgive. Father, it doesn't matter whether I feel like it or not. It doesn't matter whether I even think I can do it or not. I choose with an act of my will to forgive them, to let it go. Now, Father, you supply the feeling because I've chosen. When the devil comes with instant replays, he's a master. I walked by a man in the grocery store one time, smelled his cologne and burst into tears because some man broke my heart and wore that same cologne. I mean, I was right back there again, boo-hoo, and saw me. I'm in a grocery store. The man thought I was having a nervous breakdown. I'm sure of it. The devil's a master at instant replay. But when that starts, you say, no, I've chosen. I've chosen to forgive. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to let the instant replay come. I'm not going to go over it again. I'm not going to keep rehearsing it. I have chosen to forgive. Father, out of obedience to you, I've chosen. Forgiveness is setting the captive free and then realizing you are the one being held captive. Unforgiveness doesn't hurt them, it hurts you. It steals your joy, it steals your peace, keeps you in turmoil, steals your sleep at night. It's not about them. It doesn't mean they were right. Sometimes people think if I forgive them, it's like hey, it was okay what they did. It'll never be okay what they did. They'll never be right. It will never be okay. Forgiveness is just saying, I'm not going to let you steal one more day from me. You've taken enough of my life. You've taken enough from me. I'm not going to give you one more day. I choose to forgive for my sake, not for yours. Amen? Amen.
Actually, if you need the offering envelope, just raise your hand up. Some of your hand up in the area. The ushers will get you taken care of. We are going to receive an offering. We're going to bless this God sent couple. Amen. But I was, we did a, a, a memorial service here this morning, and there were several ministers here. There were, I don't know, maybe 10 different ministers from some churches here in town. And, and uh, a few of them got up and shared a couple minutes. And one of them pointed to the bulletin, you know, and you know, and it had a uh, precious lady that passed away that went to our church for a few years and then moved to Tulsa for two years and uh, went on to be with the Lord and it was her decision. <laughs> the story is amazing. But anyway, he, he said, you know, in your life you have from here, and it was her birthday, to here, and he said you can't do anything about this over here or this over here before you were born or after you were born. He said, but this space in between here. And uh, he said, that's that's what you have. Amen. And you know what? We don't have to give up in the space. You don't have to give up in that space. It's just a short little bit of a little bit of time that really puts things in perspective. You know, that space may be 80 years or 90 years or 100 years or whatever. Uh, but whatever that space is, don't give up. I will say it this way. Don't give up in your space. Don't give up in the space. You know, don't give up in that time because there are things for you to reach. There are things for you to do. In that amount of time, there are people for you to impact. And everybody has a chance to give up. And just like the man that she was talking about, he gave up in, in his space and he missed out on the blessing and the impact that God had for him for that space of time and for that group of people. Don't give up on yours. Don't give up on yours. And there may be people here tonight that say, you know what? I haven't even started in my space. I haven't even started. Well, get started and don't quit. Get started and then don't quit. Get following God and don't quit. Amen? Hallelujah. God's good. He's so good. Have you been blessed tonight? Amen. We're going to receive this offering. Come on, ushers. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to give, to sow into the kingdom of God, and to sow into this precious couple. Lord, we thank you for them. And Lord, just the fact that they that they come, Lord, we're honored that they would come and take the time out. And so Lord, we sow back into them. And Lord, I believe in you for big things. And we are going to be a blessing to them. And we thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
different ones that traveled here. We thank you for traveling mercies as we leave this place. And Father, we just declare the blessing of God over each one. In Jesus' name.